a very good class. Enjoyed it greatly. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. I don't have any pressure to comment. We're getting ready to start our class. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Clint. Uh, glad to see you doing well enough to at least uh, start the class again. That's really good. Um, we pray that the Lord will uh, speak through you and the Holy Spirit will guide the hearts and minds of people into the knowledge of the truth. So uh, good job that you're doing. Good to see you back there. We'll see you next time, Clint. Jerry and Natalie. Okay, Jerry and Natalie, I know you would email me a question and you're asking what is a, defi a good definition of justification. Um, I know sometimes you'll hear people will say, well, justified is just if I never sinned. Or you'll hear things like that, or God's righteousness imputed unto you. Well, that's righteousness. It's not justification. And I think you sort of mentioned that in your question. Um, so what I would say a good definition of justification is... Um, sorry, I was just hunting a verse there. I think of justification as it's being declared just. And so that is more like a courtroom setting. You know, if I go to court, they'll say, I am guilty or I'm not guilty. So they'll say, he is just in this action. You know, he didn't do it. He didn't do the crime. Or he is unjust. We need to punish him. Well, look over in Hebrews chapter 9. Because that's, spiritually speaking, uh, that's what justification is about. And Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse uh, 27, Hebrews 9, 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without, without sin unto salvation. Would you believe the gospel, Romans 6 says that we are buried with him in baptism. It says that our old man is crucified with him. Romans 6, 6 says our old man is crucified with him that the body of sins might be destroyed that we henceforth should, we not, should not serve sin. And Colossians 3, so talking to believers here, in Colossians 3, verse 3, Colossians 3, 3 says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So basically what happens is, the moment that you recognize your sin, and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, the Holy Spirit spiritually baptizes you, or identifies you, with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's why Colossians 3, 3 says, Ye are dead. Okay, so if you are dead the moment that you believe the gospel and now Christ is your life, you are dead and now Christ is your life, then that's where Hebrews 9.27 comes into play. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And we know it's talking about a spiritual thing because verse 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. So what justification is, is the moment that you... Believe the gospel, you are identified or baptized into Christ's death. So now you're dead. So spiritually speaking, then again, you don't see this happen. And if it wasn't for the scripture, we wouldn't know this. But the moment that you believe the gospel, you are dead. And so as appointed unto man wants to die after this, the judgment. So what that means, there is a spiritual courtroom, so to speak, that takes place. And again, you don't know this unless the scripture tells you. Because you're dead, so now you are judged. And so you are standing before Christ, who is the judge. And Christ judges you to be just. He looks at your life and he says, I see a perfect, sinless person here. Because he is dead and Christ is his life. And Christ obeyed God perfectly. So I see the faith of Christ that's covered his sins. And so what I've done is I have justified him. Look over in Romans 3, and this is the scripture that I was looking up, uh, because this is what it, it uses those terms there. So you can see, as the point of the man wants to die, after that the judgment, 
You see that once we believe the gospel, God says, ye are dead. So we are considered dead and Christ is our life. So therefore, since we're dead, we receive the judgment. And the judgment is that God declares us to be just. It doesn't mean we're not guilty because we are guilty of our sins. It's just that God has justified or he has paid for our sins in a just manner. So we receive God's righteousness, and that is true. I mean, I think you mentioned in your email that righteousness is a lot of times used with justification. Well, we see that here in Romans 3. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is, how do I get the righteousness of God? It is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So the faith of Christ, which would justify you, is offered to everybody, but the faith of Christ is only upon all them that believe. So when I believe the gospel, the righteousness of God is, I am I'm considered dead, so now I stand before the courtroom. And Christ as the judge imputes unto me the righteousness of God without the law, saying you are righteous based upon God's righteousness. That's what we get here from these two verses. And then verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then verse 24, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So I believe the gospel. I am dead. I am baptized into Christ, then I am in the courtroom. Christ as the judge imputes or gives to me God's righteousness by faith of Jesus Christ. I receive Christ's faith because I'm baptized into Christ. And then as the judge, Jesus Christ gives me God's righteousness because that's what Jesus Christ was. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made him, Christ, to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So once I believe the gospel, I'm taken out of Adam, I'm placed into Christ, I stand before the courtroom, Jesus Christ as the judge imputes unto me or gives me God's righteousness based upon the faith of Jesus Christ. And because I believed it, then the righteousness of God comes to me. And when I receive the righteousness of God, then I have been justified or I've been declared just in the eyes of God, so that when God looks at me, He doesn't see my sin, He doesn't send me to hell, but He sees Christ in me, He sees God's righteousness upon me, and so I'm declared just um, there, uh, freely by His grace. And you see in verse 26, Romans 3, 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So justification is God as the judge, Christ as the judge, sees that when I believe I've been placed into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, therefore he sees the faith of Jesus Christ upon me, and since faith pleases God, then the righteousness of God is given to me based upon the merits of Jesus Christ, what he did. And then as judge, Jesus Christ says, you are justified. And so then God, Jesus Christ, is just in declaring me righteous because it's based upon the merits of Jesus Christ. And he has also justified me by, as the judge, declaring me just based upon the righteousness of God, which came upon me based upon the faith of Christ because I believe the gospel. Thanks for that explanation. I, I hadn't really thought of it that way, that when we're baptized into Christ's death, like that that's the judgment at that time. So it helps to think of it that way. Yeah, thanks for that. I know that Hebrews 9, a lot of times you'll hear that when someone dies. They'll say, oh, well, it's a point that a man wants to die. You know, we're sorry that that person died, but, you know, that's just part of life is death. But uh, you can see from the context, it's really talking about a spiritual thing. It's point out a man wants to die after that the judgment so Christ bore our sins 
So now we're on a spiritual plane. So yeah, it's talking about once you, yeah, once you are, once you believe the gospel, then God says you are dead. Therefore, the judgment comes, and now Romans three takes place, and that's when justification takes place. So, yeah. thank you for that explanation. Thanks, Natalie. Very good question. Mm -hmm. Glad you could join us. Did you have hey, a? Derek. Do you have another question? While you're here, just in case. I don't. Do you have a question? I think we're good for now. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. Uh, Rick, I know you got to go walk Charlie. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I did take Charlie for a walk. I was trying to take him out for water. He was just dying of thirst here. But I got a question for you on uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, the eunuchs. He's uh, eunuchs. Uh -huh. Now, it looks to me like this first one was a say. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. Now, that one, that gift of eunuchs, could that be like uh, people that are born with a, a really weak libido? Yeah, I think that's really what it's talking about. It's the It's the gift of celibacy. So it's someone who has... A very weak or no libido. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes it clear. And now here's the other one. The last one. The middle one, I can figure that one out. Uh, the last one, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Now, that, to me, seems like, okay, there is a person that, they were not born a eunuch. They had this sex drive. Uh... But they, they start studying God's word and they build up the inner man and through that they recognize that you know sex is just a lot of hoopla. I mean, it's very much overrated, it's very much feeds the flesh, it has no spiritual value whatsoever, and so they look to God's word to feed their inner man and so they're growing their spiritual relationship with God, and so that way they become a eunuch. Is that kind of close? Yeah, that's a great way of defining it. Yeah, that's what Paul is talking about, I think. I think Paul was married, and so then he says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So Paul is able to abide without getting married. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Paul could contain. Well, how could he contain if he has already been married? Well, it's probably what you described. He was made a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He's got so much sound doctrine in the inner man that he's not following the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He's saying, Christ lives in me. I've counted all that but dung that I may win Christ. I count all but loss. And so he says... Um, yeah, that was important to me years ago. I got married. You know, I thought that was great. But now I see the spiritual is so much more important that I don't really value that, that, fleshly, that fleshly desire, even though I had it before. It sort of went down or not as bad or it's, you know, it's not a desire that I want to pursue because I see how much more excellent it is uh, serving Christ. So, yeah, I think that's what a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake is. It's... Usually those who are Bible believers, who get sound doctrine in the inner man, and that strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man, uh, part of that is overcoming that sexual desire, too, for, for the unmarried. Yeah. So I, th I think that's a good yeah, that's, explanation. That's how it seems to work in me. So, it's, it, so there's really hope for people like me. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I don't work out good with marriage. I'm not, I'm not a, maybe I'm too all selfish or something, or whatever the case, whatever the reason is, I don't work out good with marriage. I, 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 69 years, I flunked it all. <laughs> so, so this here, that, that, there's hope for me still. Yeah, that's how it seems to work for me. Yeah, Satan has really used sex to distract people. I, I think that's going to be used in the... Uh, during the tribulation, during, in a, uh, during the tribulation period, 
some a lot of people think, well, it's, it's just, you know, they're going to deny your food. They're going to deny, you know, you having a house. You're not going to, you know, you're going to have to run to the mountains and, and all that. And I'm sure that's all true. But I think he's also going to use, well, yeah, you can have all these sexual desires filled over here if you just worship me. You know, look at this. I will... You won't have to worry about your fleshly desires. You'll get your food, you'll get your housing, and you'll get all these sexual desires from me because, you know, if you just worship me. And so I think that'll be another tool that he'll use in that, not just taking away everything you own and, you know, and hunting you down like a criminal. I think they'll say, well, look, look either choose that or choose me and, and you, know, you know, worship me. And then you'll not only get that, but you'll get all your sexual pleasures all fulfilled. And I think that'll be a big draw on people. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There are some verses in the Old Testament which show that in Israel's program, of course, God didn't design it this way, but they changed their religion to where there were temple prostitutes. And there's even yeah. a verse where it talks about a father, and a man and his father lay down with the same woman there at the altar in the temple. And so I think the Antichrist is going to have sex as part of his Babylonian religious system. And so you, you look, I mean, that's how the world is really controlled. It's all controlled with sex. That's why I say, like, you don't hear of anybody nowadays who just remains a virgin their entire life. I mean, there should be some people who are like that if they're born that way from their mother's womb, as Jesus said. But it's our society has put them in the other direction. And as you mentioned, God's Word can move you away from that. So if God's Word can move you away from that, then Satan can move you toward that direction. And so if, if the whole society is just so sexually charged, that's a way that Satan can use the Antichrist to control the whole society, where you, where everything is about sex, so then that's what you follow. So then, if he offers you these sexual pleasures, if you're part, you know, lay down with the temple prostitute or whatever, it might be some technology thing. Who knows? But it'll be some kind of sexual desires fulfilled as part of their religion. That is a way how he'll get a lot of people to follow him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. Question. Very good question and insights. Very good. Helga, are you still there? You have a question? I think Helga did this last time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, Danny and Shelly, do you want to go ahead and, and ask a question or you um, want me to go to somebody else? Yeah, hello. Hey. Hey, Danny. How you doing? How you doing, Eric? Hello, uh, Ernie. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, the first, the, what, what you were talking about today, I didn't get that all the notes, uh, Eric. You know about the children being holy? I, I had, maybe I'm totally wrong, I had this mindset that uh, if they were holy, and say the, the parents, uh, yeah, and say the rapture happens, that the children would go with the parents in the rapture. Is that completely nonsensical, or is that possible? No, I don't think that's what that's saying. I think, and that's why I tried to go over Romans 7, and yeah. about the when, the, sin, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Um, I think the children, uh, whether you have believing parents or not, I think the children are judged the same way, either way. It's all based on an individual decision. It's if you've, um, if you've got the conscience upon you and you understand that your sin makes you worthy of death, then you need to believe the gospel in order to be saved. Uh, if you haven't got to that point, uh, then sin is not imputed to your account, and then you would go to heaven. Um, I just think verse 14 is talking about the, the context the context is more about the husband being sanctified by the wife and vice versa. It's more about the marriage relationship than it is the kids. And so it's talking about basically if you have an unbelieving spouse, stay with them because they're more likely to believe the gospel 
if you stay with them as to if they depart. And so I think it's a similar type message for the children. It's, um, okay. it's not that the children automatically go to heaven. It's just, you know, like your kids. Your kids are more likely to go to heaven than uh, kids that are under unbelievers because you've shared the gospel with them. You've told them okay. what sin is. So it's like they've been set apart holy. And that's why I think when it says, now are they holy, I think that's not that they're automatically going to heaven. I think it's more of a set apart sense of the word holy. Yeah. That they, they, it's like your kids have been set apart or been given a special opportunity to go to heaven by the fact that you have trained them up in the way. You have shown them their sin and that Jesus died for their sins. So that's, okay. that's how I see that um, as holy. Because if you see it as the children automatically go to heaven if you've got a believing parent or they automatically go to hell if they don't have a believing parent, well, now the eternal destination of your child isn't in their hands. It's really based on the parents. And that's not really fair. I mean, God tells in the Old Testament, He'll say the children are not to pay for the sins of the Father. Uh, so the reverse is true. The children don't go to heaven for the belief of the Father. Yeah. It's, you know, if, you know, if you just talk about the child, you know, 10 years of their life, that's one thing. But we're talking about where they're going to spend eternity. Uh, so it's not fair in that case. So I think that, um, that they have to make their own decision. So, I, so uh, I think holy, holy in terms of set apart, they've got a special yeah. opportunity to believe. Not that they're automatically yeah. saved. Yeah. Just another one. Ephesians 1.3. I've uh, been tinkering my brain. Uh, the one, blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The spiritual blessings, and it's all spiritual blessings, what is that? Well, first off, I think for the most part, it's talking about the positions that we have in heavenly places. Uh, but I think the reason it says all spiritual blessings is I think he's talking to the, the group of the body of Christ corporately. He's talk, not talking individually. Because, uh, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according. So verse 4 is going to give you a definition of how we've got those spiritual blessings. According as he hath chosen us, that's us, the body of Christ, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us, the body of Christ, unto the adoption of children. Verse 6, made us accepted in the Beloved. So I think he's talking about the group, the body of Christ corporately. He's talking about the whole group. And so the blessings, I think, are verse 21, principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named. Uh, verse 23 says he's going to fill heavenly places with his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So I think the all spiritual blessings in heavenly places is just a reference to all of those positions that are in heaven. And he's basically saying he's going to take the body of Christ corporately and put them in the, all those positions um, in heavenly places. So I think that's what the, all spiritual blessings are. It's not saying that you, Danny, are going to have a throne, a principality, a power, a might, and a dominion. You know, I think you have a position. A, because 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the judgment seat of Christ, that if... Uh, if your work survives the fire, if it's gold, silver, or precious stones, it says in verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. It's singular there. It's not plural. It's singular. So that tells me if you receive a reward, that means you receive this a position in heavenly places based upon the gold, silver, and precious stones that survived the judgment. So you would get a throne, a principality, a power, a might, a dominion. You wouldn't get all of those. But the body of Christ as a whole, all of us together, are going to fill all those positions. 
And so yeah. that, I think, is the all spiritual blessings. He hath blessed yeah. us, not he hath blessed Danny with all spiritual blessings. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places yeah. in Christ. So it's a, I think it's a corporal thing. And, uh, yeah. and what yours is, and it, the details of what your, what your blessing is or your reward, I'm not sure how that works out. You know, exactly. Okay. Well, what's the difference between a throne or a principality or a power or a might? Um, I don't know. It's, you know, one's higher than the other. One has more responsibility, so there's a greater reward for the responsibility, but it, it, the details of what that entails, I'm not sure. The only reason I say that is because uh, it, I, I'm, I'm always just joking with that because uh, because Lucifer was made uh, uh, with all of this wisdom and all of that. I'm just thinking, and he was put into that position. <laughs> and I think he didn't have to do any work for it. <laughs> so I was just thinking, uh, and we've got to do quite a lot of work. Well, I can say that, so that'd be the wrong way to look at it, but we have to work for it, uh, which was just uh, quite fascinating as I was just trying to think of the two differences of him and the body of Christ. And, but yeah, brilliant, that's a good answer, Eric, because I, I was looking at that as an, as an individual rather than a corporate point of view. Uh, that's brilliant. And last question, and, and, and I won't go on anymore. Uh, what do you think of uh, <laughs> Bill Gates buying up the farmland? Is it, I'm going off track here, but uh, we I, on that, uh, we have a newspaper called the Metro over here, and, it, and there was a little article about Bill Gates buying up the farmland in America. Uh, what, are you, what do you think of that? Do you think that that that's a uh, heading? To what Richard was saying, that uh, your the food will be sort of under a certain control if you don't do what the the necessary call it the system want you to do, because it seems to be going that way. Uh, that's what I looked at, and I thought that must be it. Otherwise, he's going to put the vaccinations in the food or something. Lana is frantically raising her hand. Ooh, ooh, teacher, teacher, ooh, teacher, teacher, let me talk on this one. <laughs> well, let, let me give you a background what's going on in just our neighborhood. Now, we're surrounded by crops. And when I say crops, I say soybeans, I say corn, I say peanuts, um, cotton. Um, and we had noticed a couple of years ago, and it's still going on now, I noticed uh, some of the uh, fields would have a sign out in front, and actually I think we did a video on that, um, had a sign out in front of the field, and it would have this corporation name and a number. And I told Eric, I said, I said, do you think some of these farmers are selling out their farms to big corporations, and they're putting the name of the, the company and whatever the number means on these uh, crops. And um, we, we did a video, gosh, what, two years ago, something like that. Well, um, we have noticed more and more crop lands being sold. And uh, what they're growing is, um, is not what God gave us. And the reason why I say that is... Um, the cotton, now I, I've seen cotton my entire life. I've seen pitch, uh, peaches, peach trees, I, you know, I've seen tomatoes. I mean, I've, you know, I, and I'm talking about back in the day when, like, even my grandparents would have a, a garden. So I know what real, real fruits and vegetables look like. The seeds that are in them that God says in the Bible they are to produce like kind. He put those seeds in those fruits and vegetables and stuff so you could produce the same, you know, you put it in the ground and it comes back up. Same, you know, same uh, kind. Watermelon went seedless 
eons ago. And at first, I thought it was great. But now that I'm older, I realize, wait a minute, maybe this is not, I noticed the watermelon, the inside, if you cut it, it is so bright red. It's, it doesn't even look real. I mean, it's just, as, and it doesn't taste the same. Erica, um, Eric also noticed recently um, his uh, boss, one of his bosses, um, got sick off a banana. And Eric eats, usually eats a banana every morning, or at least tries to. And we've noticed, I told Eric says in the morning, he says, you want part of my banana? And I'm like, sure, and he'll pinch me off a little piece. And I've been telling Eric for what? About six months or something like that. I told Eric, I said, I said, this doesn't taste and it doesn't look like a banana. I said, it does not taste the same. There's something something different about it. It's not the same. And I said, in fact, it tastes too sweet to be a banana. And so, um, and also the fact that when I grew up, fruits and vegetables were seasonal. You would only see like um, oranges, uh, bananas, especially bananas. So I'll use bananas as a thing. Bananas we would only see during the summertime. Now you can get a banana year round. Same with oranges. Oranges used to be only during the summertime. Even though our oranges came originally from Florida because we're closer to Florida. It used to be just a, a seasonal thing. You would only see grapes come out a certain time of year. You would only see, you know, certain vegetables that would come out a certain time of year. I actually do believe that, um, I don't know if, if they say Bill Gates has bought it up and he admits that he's bought up a bunch of cropland, I believe it. Because all of these corporation signs that are sitting in the front of these pasture lands with a number on it. Um, yes, I do believe it. And it's not real food. It's not real food at all. I've noticed that there's, there's a big change in, in uh, food. It doesn't sit well with my body before. And you say, oh, you're older now. No, they ain't got nothing to do with it. It, it's it's changed the texture the taste it, it's all changed and I actually believe some of it is probably part plastic um, but yes I, I think I think it's been bought up and I do believe that that has a lot to do with um, you know with the Antichrist he's going to control the food because I mean, you got corporations buying up all these croplands and they're making it harder and harder for people that do have croplands that they want to sell, like on the side of a road, have a peach stand or have a, a tomato stand where you sell your own, uh, or strawberries, you, still, you sell your own stuff just to make a few bucks. Now they're, the government's telling them, oh no, you can't sell that because we don't know what kind of fertilizer you have used. It might not be good for consumption. They're coming up with all these regulations that the farmers are having a hard time just growing their crops and they're actually going in debt. So, yes, I do believe. I, that's why I told Eric, I said, I want to grow my own garden. But it's hard to find real seeds. The real seed, because everything is pretty much gone seedless. So it's hard for you to grow your own crops. And you can't go into the store at Walmart and buy a little packet of seeds. Well, whatever grows, it's not going to have a seed in it. So you can't take the seed out and plant it and just keep your crop grow, uh, going. you got to depend on the government to get your seeds. So that's my two cents worth. You know what, uh, Nathan, he fills in for me sometimes. He has his own Bible study on Monday night. Uh, he grew up on a farm in California, and his parents have had to give that up due to all the regulations, the fees, and everything. Uh, what they're doing is they're squeezing out, like you say, 
if Bill Gates is buying up the farmland, he's doing that out of the uh, request of the Illuminati. And the idea is to take over the entire food supply. Uh, Matthew 25, look at Matthew 25, talking about that tribulation period. You got the believers there. Um, and he says to the Gentiles, you got believing Jews, but he judges the Gentiles and judges the nations based on how they treated believing Israel. And he says in verse 34, Matthew 25, 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, these are the believing Gentiles, Come ye, blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we of thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Revelation 13 says that the Antichrist causes all to take the mark of the beast, and if they don't take the mark, they can't buy or sell. Well, this chapter here gives you the specifics of that. It means, because, you know, for me, I don't have to rely upon someone to give me a hand up. They don't have to give me drink and food and clothing and shelter, and they don't have to visit me in prison. Because I can go and work at a job and take care of myself. Uh, these people are apparently physically able to hold down a job and get money and take care of themselves. But the problem is the Antichrist controls the entire economy. So if I don't take the mark of the beast, I can't buy or sell. I don't take the mark, so then I can't participate in the economy. So I'm willing to work, but I can't get, I can't get anybody, I can't participate, I can't get a job, I can't get money to support myself because I don't take the mark. And I can't just have an acre of land and grow my own crops. You know, you think at least if I had already had some land that I owned, you know, you own a house, you got five acres of land, let's say, and you could have a garden and you could grow your crops. Well, apparently I can't do that because i got to rely upon handouts from the Gentiles. These are Jews. The reason the Jews are in that trouble is they're in Jerusalem. You know, that's where the Antichrist is going to be. So they're in the center of it. There may be some Gentiles outside of that system who are able to grow their own crops. You know, that's why I said flee to the mountains, get out of that city, get out of that system. So there are these Gentiles that are outside of that system that can grow their own crops and get those and you know get food and then get it to these Jews. But Jesus told Israel in Acts chapter 1, he told believing Israel, um, well, Probably better than that, um, instead of the Acts 1, look at uh, Matthew 10. Uh, this would be better. Look at Matthew 10. He told Israel in uh, verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Matthew 10, 5, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they're told to only... Uh, they're told to go out and preach the gospel, but only do so in Israel. Then you go down to verse 23, Matthew 10, 23, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So the little flock's ministry in the tribulation period is for them to go from city to city in Israel to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, the Antichrist is going to be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, and he's going to say, if you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. You can't participate in the economic system. Now, there could be some Gentiles in a different country or in a different area out, out in the country, outside of cities, who are growing their own crops and being able to uh, get food to the Jews who are going out and preaching the gospel. But these Jews cannot participate 
and the economic system. They, 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 they can't be self-sufficient because they've got to stay in the cities and go from city to city to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's where the biggest threat is. Um, those are the, pe the people who are going to take the mark. Well, just like today, let's say, with the vaccine, COVID vaccine. The people who are going to take the vaccine are going to be the people in the cities first. People that are out in the country, if you've got farmland and you've got your own crops, uh, you know, you've got, say, you got your own crops, you got a little lake there, you've got fish you can hunt, uh, or you got, yeah, you can catch fish, or you can go hunt deer or ducks or something. Um, you, don't need to, you don't need to take the vaccine because they'll say, well, if you don't take the vaccine, you can't work. You can't get this job. You got to have this COVID, the certificate of uh, vaccination ID. You got to have this COVID, the ID, to show you've taken the vaccine to get a job. Well, if I've got 40 acres of land where I'm growing my own crops, I shoot the deer that come out there or I catch the fish, well, I don't need to participate. I don't have to get the vaccine. But if I'm in the city and I'm relying upon that job I have, well, now I got to get the vaccine or else I lose my job. So it's a similar thing. Now for Israel, they have to stay in that city system because they're told to go from city to city in Israel to preach the gospel to Israel. So they have to stay in the city system, but they're not going to take the mark. So that's why they're hungry, they're thirsty, they don't have shelter, they don't have clothing, and they get thrown in jail because they're not obeying the city's rules. So what's going on with Bill Gates is, and this is the Illuminati is behind the idea of bringing their Messiah, who they're going to call the Christ, and he's going to be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem and ruling the whole world from that spot. That's what the Illuminati is working toward because they're, they're doing what Satan wants to do and that's what Satan wants to do is set up a false Christ in Jerusalem. And so Bill Gates is part of that. He's trying to get the vaccine out there so people will get... You. The vaccine isn't the mark of the beast, but it's very similar. If I don't take the vaccine... I don't have a job, I can't buy or sell. If I don't take the mark of the beast in the tribulation period, I can't buy or sell. It's all about the control of the government. The vaccine is all about the government, not about getting rid of COVID. I mean, COVID, we've had flu, people get killed from the flu. I mean, you don't see them, oh, you got to take the flu shot. COVID vaccine is all about controlling everybody. Because then they can say, if you don't have that vaccine, then you don't have a job. And you'll say, oh, I don't care. I'll just go out and farm my own land. Oh, sorry, Bill Gates bought that. So you can't do that. So if they buy up the farmland, the more land and everything they have, then when they say, you take that vaccine or else you can't, you can't support yourself, uh, you're less likely to be able to support yourself. I know I've heard from someone who watches uh, my videos, uh, lives in Nebraska. He's tried to get, buy, he's been there for years, try to buy something. You know, Nebraska, for the most part, is farmland. There aren't too many cities there. And uh, it's just way too expensive. You'd think it'd be super cheap because, you know, there's no city there, but he can't afford anything there. It's expensive. Well, that's because supply and demand. If you've got the Illuminati buying up farmland, well, then the demand is high for that. And so now you don't have the money to buy it up. The rich people are buying it up. So the rich people are getting more control. If they get more control over the farmland, they have more control over the food supply. If they have control over the food supply, then you've got to do what they say to do. You can't say, I'm getting out of your economic system. I'm going to be self-sufficient. I'll catch my own fish, shoot my own deer, grow my own tomatoes and oranges or whatever. You can't do that. So, yeah, it's all... Yeah, Bill Gates buying up the farmland is all part of the Illuminati's plan to get complete control over the food supply. And you see that uh, for Israel is, you know, it's not going to be completely successful. It's not going to be 100% because you have the Gentiles who are giving them food. Um, and they, the Gentiles enter the kingdom there in Matthew 25. So they have to be believers. If the Gentiles took the mark, Revelation 14 says they would have their place in the lake of fire. So these Gentiles must not have taken the mark since they're brought into the kingdom of God. Uh, but they're able to get food somehow. And that's because they're out in the country and got uh, their own farmland that they could control. But, uh, you know, the, the goal of, of Satan is, you know, think about God, is God does everything by love. 
God doesn't force anybody to believe the gospel, doesn't force anybody to go to heaven. He's all about, I've commended my love toward you by sending my son. You either accept it or not. But Satan is all about forcing people and going against, it's you do what I want you to do. If you don't do it, I'll kill you or I'll throw you in prison. And so that's what, that's what buying up the farmland is all about. It's about the Illuminati getting control of all that land so that when they say, if you don't take the vaccine, then you don't have a job. And that way you can't say, well, I'm just going to go out on my own. You're more forced into that situation. It's like buying up that farmland is sort of like making a, a, a tunnel that you are forced to go down. Because you can't route and say, oh, I'm not participating in that. I'm going to have my own. So, yeah, it's all, it's all about control. It's all about the Illuminati and uh, uh, leading up to the Antichrist. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking as well, uh, what's going on. And just uh, on the back of that, when I was little, I used to see these men in London, and you used to have these placards, like the end is nigh, uh, Jesus is coming back, repent, and stuff, and I was just sort of like, yeah, they'd be on street corners, they're, they're no more, no more, no more, uh, and I used to look at them, and I used to think, it used to make me scared as a child, thinking, oh God, Jesus is coming back, and uh, as time went on, you would think, okay, well, he's not really coming back as quick as they are saying on the street corners. But now, as we can see this program progressing aggressively, uh, I'm trying to, because we're in an age of grace, so this is what I'm just trying to work out. Is this the backdrop of prophecy underneath grace starting to slowly elevate up? before the rapture, or, or is it not, or is it just a, a, a prelude to what's to come? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, we're not in, we're not getting prophecy fulfilled today because we're in the dispensation of grace, but I do think it's getting toward that point where it can be fulfilled. For example... The only, way I, it's, the only reason why I say that is because when, when, when prophecy was uh, dying, tailing off, that grace was taking place, uh, starting to uh, uh, take off as prophecy sort of died off. So that's what I'm kind of sort of thinking to myself, maybe that's the same kind of course that's going to happen, or, are we just, or is grace just going to be cut off by the rapture, and then it just happens. Uh, and the reason I say that, by the prophecies, because these kind of things, what are happening, seem to be playing that note, what the Bible's talking about, about the control of the world now coming into place. And like you said, the Illuminati putting uh, their Antichrist on the throne. And I'm just thinking to myself, he must be about now, Antichrist. Uh, maybe at a young age, I don't know, but he must be about... Uh, if, if this is now being put into place, they must have an idea, Illuminati, uh, of this man of sin coming in to sit on the throne. Yeah, they, um, I think probably the one who is going to be the Antichrist is probably uh, going to come from the Mormon church. The Mormons was set up by the Illuminati. They teach that Lucifer was Jesus' brother. Mm -hmm. And they believe that uh, they've got, the Illuminati has 13 families, and the 13th family is over the other 12. And the 13th is sort of considered the ones that's going to rule. And that's where the Antichrist would come from. And that 13th family, they believe, has both the, the blood of Jesus in it and also the blood of Lucifer in there. Uh, that's why you'll hear these things like when the Da Vinci Code came out. I didn't read it, but I heard where they said like, oh, well, Jesus married Mary Magdalene and they had kids. Well, that's all about establishing Jesus' bloodline. 
Jesus didn't have, he didn't get married, he didn't have kids. Yeah. But if you make up that lie, then you could try to trace back and say, this is in Jesus' line, but then it's also in Lucifer's line. Uh, the Mormon presidents have all been people from that 13th family of the Illuminati. Um, so I think that, and the Bible says it's got to be a Jew too, but you can see that they've set up this Mormon, the Mormons have a trust fund with over a hundred billion dollars in it. Uh, the religious, the organizations, uh, nonprofits in the United States, they're required to distribute a certain percentage of any money because they're not profit. They're not supposed to be hoarding money. They're supposed yeah. to distribute a certain percentage uh, for the public's good, and that's why they're uh, that's why they're tax exempt. They're tax exempt because they say, "Oh, this organization exists for the public's good." Well, they've got over a hundred billion, not million, but billion with a B, over a hundred billion dollar stockpile in some investments, uh, very secretive how they've done it. Um, there, and they've said, this is for the second coming of Christ, is what they've said. Well, of course, Jesus is going to destroy the Babylon and the economic system, so you got a hundred billion dollars in U.S. currency, it's worthless when Jesus comes, but... but their idea is we're going to bring in our Christ and he's going to sit on the throne. So when they've got, so they've set up a religion that says Jesus and Lucifer are brothers, which goes along with their 13th family, the Illuminati, which controls all of them, which says that everybody in this family has both Jesus' line and Lucifer's line, blood in it. So that makes them the rulers. That's where it makes them worthy of being that ruler on the throne yeah. and in the world. And so they've, they've got that family. They've set up their stories about Mary Magdalene and the kids so that they can have that all set up. Now they got $100 billion in this trust fund uh, waiting for the second coming of Christ. So, yeah, all of these things are being set up. And you can see things like in Revelation 13, what I was going to show you is that um, halfway through the tribulation period, there is the... Uh, the false prophet that comes out of the earth and he gets people to worship the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 12 says, He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he's getting people to worship the Antichrist. Verse 13 says, He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So you see in there, there's going to be, for this to take place, you've got to have technology. Or I can't see this happening, say, 200 years ago. The technology wasn't there. But nowadays, I could see, well, if he gives power, he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image should both speak, and cause him to worship the image, well, to me, that image of the beast is uh, artificial intelligence technology. That it can now speak through this artificial intelligence and it can kill people. It's a machine that can kill people. It can, it's a machine that can cause people to worship it. And then if he causeth all, both small and great, to receive a mark, and if you don't have the mark, you can't buy or sell, you got to have the technology to be able to track that. To put some kind of computer chip in the third eye here, on your forehead or in the right hand so that now instead of using my credit card or using cash the only way I can transact anything is the is my money or the currency is related to that chip that's within me and there's no such thing as identity theft because it's a unique chip that's implanted into my body and that's the only way I can buy or sell so identity theft and uh, stealing somebody's funds and all that is completely taken away well, you got to have the technology to do that. Um, you know, right now, if you said, oh, you got to have that, well, I could just use, I could take out my wallet and start 
handing 20s to the grocery store to get money. But if you, you have to have technology to be able to eliminate all paper currency and just have digital currency. And then you got to have the digital currency attached to the person uh, for this to work. So you got to have the technology. Why is it that Bitcoin was worth $8,000 US dollars for every Bitcoin September of last year? And now we're five or six months later and it's up to 50, it hit 58,000 a week ago. It goes from 8,000 to 58,000. Why is it so valuable? Well, the people who control the money supply are the ones who are trying to bring in the Antichrist and they need a digital currency. I'm not saying Bitcoin is the digital currency, but they need to get you off of a paper currency or a nation's currency. It's not going to be the US dollar or the British pound or something. It's going to be a one world digital currency that can be put into a chip that they can take that money off of it that's implanted in your right hand or in your forehead right. there and and add money to it if you're in the system. So the technology has to be there for that to happen. And you can see the technology is there and you can see the Illuminati is prepared to bring in this. They, they got a hundred billion dollars in store in the Mormon church ready for the time when they say, okay, let's bring them in. Well, how do you bring them in? hundred billion dollars would go a long way to bring in a world ruler, you know. With money, you can do anything, pretty much. Absolutely. So, yeah. so, uh, so you yeah. see all like that stuff. Said, like you said, Eric, over here, I remember there was a news report was saying, uh, a guy was saying that uh, the COVID can stick to paper and to metal. Uh, he didn't actually mention it, but uh, those that were in the know would probably think, okay, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about metals, which is the, which is the coins paper which is the, the, the power notes so exactly what you're saying there so they were given that, that we need to get rid of the paper and the coins because covid can stick to it it can't stick to a digital currency so yeah we're, we're, we're definitely on the way yeah so when you see the scripture what the scripture says is going to happen yeah. you see the technology that's needed and you see all these pieces being in place I mean, sure, yes. prophecy is not fulfilled today, and it won't be until the rapture, but when you see all these pieces coming together, you could say the rapture must be close, or yes. else why would you have this, you know? Why would you have the technology? The techno there are people in Sweden that are already getting a chip implanted in their right hand and using that as currency. That's happened today already. They're more technologically advanced or more accepting of that in Sweden. Um, so if that's already started, you know, how long will it take for the whole world to embrace that technology? You know, not too long. Right. So, yeah, yeah this, the stage is definitely yeah. set. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Eric. I'll let someone else speak. Thank you. Very good. I like the questions and discu discussion. Very good. Right. Helga, you finally came back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the whole time, but my husband had hunger. <laughs> oh, okay. You can feed him. <laughs> and I too. <laughs> yeah. I heard you all speaking. <laughs> Very good study. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? Also, and uh, married again, and this stuff. Um, yeah, was all my life an uh, issue, and now I'm, I'm really at peace with that. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, one thing to say, a lot of people are in that condition where they've been married, got divorced, and get remarried. And uh, yeah. we'll go into that more next week. But, uh, you know, people in that condition, Paul would say, you know, stay with the one you're at, and with at the one you're married to now because uh, you've made that lifelong commitment with that person. So that's the one you would stay with. So, yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Glad you could join us. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you got a question? No, no questions. Very good study here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Lenny and Lisa, you got a question? Hey, everybody. Um, no, but it was a great study. Hey, hey again, Helga. Um, hey, Danny. 
uh, it was a great study and great teaching on justification too, Eric. Um, just that was really good. So um, just thank, thank you. And uh, Lenny's listening. He just doesn't want to be on camera. Uh, he says, Lonnie, can I stand? Yeah, I've got one like that over here, <laughs> off camera. <laughs> Their hearts are with us. We just can't see them. <laughs> All right, love y'all so much. All right, thanks, Lisa. We love you, too. Love you, too, Lenny, even though you're <laughs> off camera. <laughs> love you, Eric. Uh, Ernie and Liz. Come on down. I know you got a question. Uh, uh, yeah, that was, uh, uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, the food thing. Or, uh, did you hear his latest thing? He said, we uh, developed countries should be eating synthetic meat. They already got that. That's the plant-based stuff. Wow. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, Elizabeth had to leave. Uh, she's out at her daughter's. Uh, but she had a question that uh, I'm not touching this marriage stuff with a ten foot pole. I mean, everything's working good for us. So. Uh, uh, she she definitely is the better half. Let me just say that. And uh, yeah, she puts up a lot with me because I I I get. Uh, I get down a bit and stuff, and you know, and I start talking about, you know, things that are happening in the world, and like she's like, you know, let's just try to be happy in the Lord, and you know, so she's definitely my cheerleader. Anyway, uh, yeah, she wanted to ask a question about Genesis nine in relation to marriage and uh, all that stuff. Uh, she just called me, so. Uh, Genesis 9, 1, uh, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and so on. So, like, she was just saying, like, uh, or asking, like, Paul, like, in 1 Timothy 4, 3, 1 Timothy 5, 11, for, she gave me all these scriptures, 1 Timothy 5, 14, you know, about women uh, uh, having children and all that sort of thing. Uh, so, like, God has given that desire, uh, so, you know, like in Corinthians, he's saying, you know, don't, but then in Timothy, he's saying, yeah, go ahead, get married, and, you know, so, she was just wondering about that, um, and for myself, too, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I couldn't, like, for me, I couldn't imagine myself not uh, having my wife and being married. Uh, I would, I'm not, the, like, the companionship, the, like, to me, like, I know what Paul's saying. Uh, I read that before I got married, and I mentioned it to my, to Elizabeth when we weren't, married and she goes well why didn't you read that like three years ago before you saw, started dating me because <laughs> then i always have second thoughts about getting married right but uh yeah i mean uh, i don't know are there like you know just like there's men who are possibly eunuchs like you read i mean aren't there some men who just need a helpmate like you know or somebody to tell them what to do yeah. yeah, most men are like that. Yeah. Okay. They, they, well, well, you think of how God, you think of how God made man. He made, right. he, he made, when well, Genesis, like Genesis chapter 2, you look at it. Um, when God made man, he made him complete. Um, he was, well, let, look at Genesis 5 first. Uh, Genesis 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. 
Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Adam was made a complete human in the image of God and that includes his mind both having the male and the female counterparts in him. As it says, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. So God made Adam a complete person with a male brain and a female brain all in one. And then in Genesis chapter 2, um, when God made Eve, he made woman, it says in verse 21, Genesis 2, 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So he takes a rib out of Adam, closes up the flesh, so now Adam is missing something that was in his body. <coughs> and it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So what God does is, here's the, here's the issue, is that if man, when, when God made man, he said in verse 18, well, when he made woman, he said, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Well, why is that? Why, does, why is it not good for a man to be alone? It was good for God to be alone. I mean, God says in the book of Isaiah, I am God and there is none else. There is no other God beside me. I am the only one. That wasn't bad that God is by himself basically the only God. There's nothing bad about that. Uh, God didn't say, oh, I need a help me. Let me create a woman God. He doesn't do that. He is just, he is the God. There is no other God. So, but man, God makes man. We saw in Genesis 5, he made man in his image. Male and female are within Adam. He called their name Adam. So why is it though that God says it's not good for man to be alone and then he makes woman, but it's good for God to be alone? Well, the reason is because man isn't God. He's made in the image of God, but he's made lower than God. In fact, he's made a little lower than the angels. And because of that, man will, and God knows this, that man in his pride will end up rejecting God. So if God keeps man to be in his image, male and female together, all in one body, then what's going to end up happening is man is going to rebel against God and then he's lost forever. It's just like Satan. Satan was created as Lucifer. Ezekiel 28 says, and I'll read it to you over in Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, it says about Lucifer in verse 12. Ezekiel 28, 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Well, this is really Satan. He, and say unto him, thou, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Uh, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. We see from verse, 20, from verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Uh, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. So then when he sinned, he says at the end of verse 16, Do he to his sin, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So he makes Lucifer perfect in wisdom and beauty, wonderful creature. But then Lucifer becomes prideful and he sins. And so then God says, I've got to destroy him. I'm going to cast him out. There is no redemption plan for Lucifer. Once he became Satan, he was lost forever. So when God made man, God made us in the image of God. We had wisdom, 
I mean, Adam is very wise because before Eve came along, God brought every animal that God named in front of Adam and had him name them. I mean, I couldn't do that. I couldn't come up with a unique name that would describe every single animal. But Adam had great wisdom that he could do that. He could call that animal a cat. He could call a different animal a dog, another one a giraffe, another one an elephant. I mean, he figured out an, a name for every single animal that fit their characteristics. Very wise. The reason that God says, it is not good that the man should be alone, I will make a help meet for him, is that God doesn't want to happen to man what happened with Lucifer. He knows man is going to sin. And when man sins, he wants to make sure there is a way for him to be saved. So he gives the commandment to the, woman, to the man, then he makes the woman, so then when both the woman and the man sin, the man is responsible for the sin and not the woman, because the commandment was given to the man and not to the woman. So now through the woman, the man can be saved. But what he does is, he takes, so God takes the rib out of Adam's side and creates a woman. And he says in Genesis 2.23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So woman was a part of man. The female was part of him. What God does is he creates a different body for woman and takes him out of the man and takes the mind, the female mind, takes it out of Adam and puts it in the body of the woman. So now Adam only has a male mind. So then that way, like we talked last week, you get married and your spouse keeps your sins in check and you keep her sins in check because your minds are different. If I had both a male and a female mind in my, in my brain, I would be like Lucifer. We all would. We would just say, I don't need God because I am God. I got everything figured out. And I would never believe God, and I'd be lost forever. So God takes out a part of the brain that we need, the female part, gives it to her, and then she, so she needs our brain, and we need her brain, but more importantly, we need to keep each other's sin, nature, in check so that we don't become prideful. Because I know I don't have it all figured out, because my wife sees things I can't see. And I think the reverse is the case as well, because that's how God made it. She's shaking her head yes, so... Um, well, that's why God says two shall become one. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, when he says, once God has taken out the woman from the man, it's like a part of him is missing now. So that's why he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So I think within, I'd say all of us, there is a um, recognition, if we look at things rationally, we don't get caught up in our pride, um, if we look at things logically, then we would recognize that we are not complete without a spouse of the opposite sex. Because, we, because part of our mind isn't there. The woman doesn't have the male mind, and the man doesn't have the female mind. And so there is the natural desire. Since this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, therefore, based upon that fact, a man is going to leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. So there is the natural tendency for a man to want to get married to a woman and a woman to get married to a man because we are incomplete without that other person. If we go through life single, a part of us is missing. It's the... Fee, it's the other, the opposite sex counterpart. What Paul is saying is that, like you look in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, talking about in the body of Christ, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So spiritually speaking, who I am in Christ trumps who I am in the flesh. And so I can, if I operate exclusively in Christ, there really is no male or female in that spirit realm. 
the mind of Christ is all. Colossians 2 says, 2.10 says, ye are complete in him. Christ was born a man. He wasn't a woman. He was a man. And yet I am complete in a man without the female counterpart because in the spirit realm, because Jesus lived above the curse of sin, in the spirit realm, there isn't the necessity for male and female together. So in Christ, I can operate whole in Christ, both male and female, spiritually speaking, because there is no male or female in that realm. So that's why Paul says, since we are ambassadors for Christ, and Christ is all that we need, and we are complete in Him in the spirit realm, then we don't need to be married. But for the physical realm, um, there is the desire, I think in all of us, I, I think even those with the gift of celibacy still have the desire to marry someone of the opposite sex. It's a natural desire, not, not for a sexual type thing, because they don't have that if they have the gift of celibacy. It's like you say, the companion type of thing. Um, the guy that uh, was pastor of the church um, up in Clanton, Alabama, you know, before I was pastor, he was retired. Well, he saw a, his wife had died or separated or something happened, and so he sought a female companion. In his physical condition, I doubt there was anything sexual going on, um, but it was a more of a, he felt alone. You know, the guy, the guy is older. The sexual drive is pretty much gone for him, I would think. Even if it's there, he's probably not physically able to have kids. I have a great uncle whose uh, wife died. He got married again. He was 88. I think she was 83 when they got married. It wasn't for sexual reasons. They wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to have kids. I'm going to replenish the earth. It was a companion type thing. It's because in the flesh... I am incomplete without the female mind. Um, so, Paul is saying, if you can deal without that, first off, if you have the gift of celibacy, then the sex thing is off the table. You don't have to worry about that. But then there's that companion issue. It's you're incomplete without that female mind. Uh, so, um, but Christ, in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So, in Christ that can overcome that. But like you say, you know, it's it can be a, a very difficult thing. Paul said, I think one of the scriptures she mentioned from 1 Timothy 5, if a woman is widowed and she is under 60, uh, she will uh, refuse her, don't support her as a widow because she's gonna, she should get remarried. Well, what do you mean? Paul just said that you should uh, stay away from getting married but yet in 1 Timothy, he says, if a woman is under 60, she needs to get remarried. So isn't that a contradiction? Well, really, 1 Corinthians 7 is dealing more with the sex drive. And uh, if that is going to hinder you from Christ living in you. And in 1 Timothy, he's talking about more of the companion issue. And that this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So, you have somebody like the person who was the pastor of the church, or my great uncle who was 88 years old. Uh, sex isn't the issue. It's companionship. It's basically, I don't want to die alone. Or, I don't want to live my last... He lived another... He lived 103. So he says, I don't want to live the next 15 years of my life, which is probably the most he would ever think he would live. I still, I'm 88, I still don't want to live 15 years without having the companionship of a woman because I'm incomplete because I don't have her mind. I only have the male mind. So I think, I think the reason, it's not a contradiction in 1 Timothy. It's more or less a different focus. Remember, the Corinthians are carnal. Um, so, the, like, you know, like my Uncle Richard said, the more he gets sound doctrine in his inner man, the less the sex drive is an issue for him. But there's still the companion issue as well. So what does he do? He gets a dog, you know, because that's, it's not the same as having a wife, but it's very, very, on a very minute scale, similar in that I've at least got somebody here as my companion. The, the, the uh, dog won't help me out whatsoever. It won't, it can't speak, it can't, you know, it can't help around the house. Oh, I, I got to serve it, but at least it's something, you know. Um, 
there is that longing for companionship with all of us, even if the sex drive is just a thing of the past for us. He, you know, and in Christ there is neither male nor female. So I think Corinthians was more focused on the sex drive because the Corinthians are carnal. They don't have the sound doctrine built up in the inner man. When you get to Timothy, we're talking about mature saints, or at least that's what they should be, because it's more of the church as a whole type thing and how the church should function. And he's saying, well, the younger women, if they're widows and they're under 60, they should get marriage because they'll wax wanton against Christ. Well, Christ is all they need. They're complete in Him, but they don't have the physical companionship. I mean, we're, we, we would be... We would not be logical, rational people if we said that once we're saved, the earthly things don't matter. Because we're still in the world. We still have to have earthly considerations. And it's hard to go around in this world without the companionship of someone of the opposite sex because you don't have their mind. When I was uh, the pastor, I took over for the... the person who was pastor church and retired. Um, there were it was a small church, and so Lana thought of things to do. The, on Father's Day, she gave out pins to the fathers. On Mother's Day, she gave out, uh, I think, carnations or roses to the mothers. You know, it was a small church. We had 10 to 20. You know, we could afford to buy, you know, little things and give it out to them. Um, that was a wonderful thing she did to help out the local body of Christ there. As a man, I never would have thought of any of that stuff. It's not that I didn't care about the fathers or care about the mothers. Maybe I would have mentioned them and had a special sermon for fathers or mothers. But the physical, the fleshly things, to feel them loved and appreciated as part of that local body of Christ, my mind just doesn't think that way. My, the male mind, just it's not that I'm rude, I'm unloving, I'm inconsiderate. I just don't think of that. Because no. that's more of the female mind. God put that in the female mind to think of those things. And so I, was, I would have been an incomplete pastor without my wife being there to think of those things. So I had her to be my helpmeet. And the two minds came together to become one unit, working together as one in that body of Christ as a pastor. It wasn't just me being the pastor doing the sermon, it was her as well. I mean, she came up with things, bringing food and, you know, snacks and uh, making sure the place was clean. I mean, you should have seen, you should have seen the apartment I had when I was single. Uh, it was definitely not clean. It was, you know, <laughs> I'd make the bed once every six months if I was lucky. Don't even talk about cleaning the sheets, you know. It's just oh, okay. something. It's just something that didn't enter into my mind, you know. Um, so yeah, there's. Uh, so I think it's the Corinthians is a, uh, the sexual okay, drive the for, yeah. uh, beginner type Christians, and Timothy is more for the mature Christians and okay. how things should function, and, okay, and there's the companion sense. view versus the sexual view. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I'll 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 run that by her. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, men really don't see things, you know. <laughs> it's sort of like anyway. So, so we talked about that last time. Uh, yeah. So can I just uh, ask the follow up? Sure. Um, so Genesis nine as Genesis eight. Um, well, like Genesis 9, for instance, the Noahic Covenant, uh, is that still, like, that's still in operation now, right? Even in the dispensation of grace. Like, when you read verse 22 of chapter 8, it says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, night and day shall not cease. So I would take it that that is still in operation. We still see... I don't know if that, the bow that God put in the sky at that time, I mean, you know, we see rainbows now, and that's kind of a reminder of that covenant. Uh, so right. it's, it's, it's still going, right, this, this covenant? Right. I, I think that um, for us in the dispensation of grace, 
the Genesis 9-1 covenant. I mean, sure, the Noahic covenant is still going on. You still have the rainbow. Uh, you still have those promises there. Uh, so as a whole, I mean, physically speaking, I guess you could say that it's still a commandment. But uh, for the most part, for us in the body of Christ, it's more of a spiritual commandment. Because you, you already have plenty of people on this. Noah was... Um, you had eight people. When it came out of the ark, there were eight people on the earth. Uh, today, there are mm -hmm. almost eight billion. There's a lot more. So the need to propagate the human race, physically speaking, was more important for Noah than it is for us today. If Noah right. and his family did not physically reproduce, they'd all die off and there'd be nobody on the earth. If my wife and I do not physically reproduce, that's not going to happen. There's eight billion people out here. So it's uh, the world's going to go on without us, you know, uh, doing that. But, but as far um, as the as far as the seed time and the harvest and all that, like, you know, this global warming and all this, you know, stuff they're talking about. I mean, this verse tells me there's going to be seed time and harvest, summer and winter. I mean, that's not going to change, right? Yeah, yeah. Verse it, twenty-two continues. Yes, it's yeah, uh, so that. We cannot, uh, the, the alarmist out there want to make us think that we can destroy the earth if we, we got to yeah. stop creating fossil fuels, stop having cars and stop, right. yeah, yeah um, you know, the global warming, got to reduce the carbon monoxide and all these greenhouse gases. Um, that couldn't have, we can't destroy the earth if we wanted to. I mean, yeah, I, let's say, I, I don't think those things are destroying the earth, but even if they were, if we were, were, were working toward that, um, God would supernaturally intervene and uh, restore order again, you know, bring the ozone layer back or whatever it is that we've damaged, we've done because of God's promise here. Yeah, but the, yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, you know, we've got to be, you know, I'm not going to pour DDT in my sewer at home, right? <laughs> right. But you know, <laughs> but this alarmist stuff that's like ridiculous, you know, because. The promise is there. It's going to keep going, right? So Yeah. Anyway. And, and okay. the brief, fruitful, and multiply for us mainly focuses on the spiritual because the physical has been taken care of. You know, when right. the fullness, the rapture will take place when the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So if, if no believers are preaching the gospel to anybody, then we are not being fruitful and multiplying and replenishing the earth from a spiritual perspective. And so the dispensation of grace has to end. But if we're out there right. preaching the gospel, then people are being saved. And so then we are being fruitful and multiplying. And the fullness of the Gentiles hasn't come in yet. So it's, it's okay. more of a spiritual now, thing for us. Yeah. Okay, now, this is a totally practical question now. Okay. Uh, you know, Danny brought up about, you know, things that are happening in the world here. And yeah, I mean, for me, like when I see this as, it kind of freaks me out, okay? I got to be honest with you. Sure. You know, you, you see, you know, currency and, like, our country up here in Canada, I mean, our our uh, our debt now is higher than our GDP. So, I mean, our prime minister is deliberately trying to bankrupt the country so that yeah. we can be part of the United Nations, right? So... Okay. I don't know. Like, I mean, uh, I remember Richard Jordan said, you know, when we see everything happening around us, uh, I don't know if he said, yeah, he said that at the conference. Remember, he said, oh, we're, we're more worried about losing our stuff, you know? <laughs> so, and I guess it's just we got to just buck up and say, okay, this is what's happening, and just enjoy life. Try to spread the gospel. Try to edify those that are saved. Bring them into the knowledge of right division, and uh, you know, do what you're doing. Uh, but you know, sometimes you just like you know, wake up in the middle of the night and you're kind of overwhelmed. Like, wow, it's moving so fast, like so fast. Yeah. You know. So how do you keep yourself from getting unnerved? You know, like. Me personally, I uh, watch as little of the news as possible. I used to watch the news in the morning, uh, mainly yeah. to get the weather. And, but then you see all this other stuff. Once COVID hit, I just stopped doing that. 
Um, oh, okay. I, I uh, eat breakfast at 5.30 in the morning, and that's the same time here that Les Feldick comes on. So instead of watching the news, I'm watching him. And then when we mm. both sit down and eat at the same time, I watch, we watch the uh, King James Bible on DVD. And we're yeah. watching that. Right. So, so I'm getting Les Feldick and I'm getting the Bible instead of listening to what's going on in the world. Um, and that way it keeps my mind off of that. I mean, I still know. I mean, I don't have my head in the sand. I still hear, you know, major things that happen. Um, right. So I still hear that. But it's just I'm less likely to worry about it. And even if I do hear things, I know it's all... I mean, I, I could tell you what I think is happening. You know, like you say, they're trying to bankrupt uh, Canada. They're doing the same thing here in the U.S., Six trillion dollars right. in stimulus packages last year. Uh, they just created the money out of thin air. Now Biden's trying to do another 1.9 billion. Um, if they pass the minimum wage of 15 dollars an hour, that will effectively eliminate middle class uh, outside of big cities. They'll all be gone. Right. Um, so I know what's happening. First off, I don't worry about it so much because I can't control it. You know, okay. if I'm worrying about it, you know, Jesus said. Uh, what man, by taking thought, added one measure to his height? So if I can't control, if I can't make myself grow three inches taller, then there's no need to worry about it. So it's the same thing with, with the economy. I mean, I, yeah, maybe I lose my house or I lose my job, but um, I can't really... And so, yeah, it's, it's going to concern me. I'm not going to say... You know, I'm so heavenly minded that I don't think about that stuff. But it's more or less trying to recognize that this is all part of the policy of evil. I think right. that what they're doing right now, the U.S. dollar is really the... If there is a world currency, it's the U.S. dollar. A lot of things like oil, for example, all oil trades are pegged to the U.S. dollar. Uh, so a lot of things are controlled by the U.S. dollar. Um, that's our world currency, so to speak. I think what they're doing is they're trying to bankrupt Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, uh, bankrupt these currencies with the goal of everything being, re at least initially, being pegged to the Chinese currency. Because right. the Antichrist yeah. is a communist. He's, uh, he's got a one-world government, and he controls right. everything. It's not a capitalist society, it's a communist society. So if he could... So the first goal is to bankrupt these capital, the currencies of capitalist uh, countries. And then it, once they get everything pegged to the Chinese, what is it, the Wong or Yan? Yong or something. I forget what it's called, but whatever the currency is, once they get it pegged to the Chinese currency, well, now it's pegged to a communist currency. And so then it'll make it much easier to bring in the Antichrist. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in a capitalist society, I know the Antichrist is communist, and we're getting toward that. So if they're going to try to bankrupt the U.S. dollar, and everything I own is based on U.S. dollars, well, that's a concern. But I can't worry about it too much because I can't control it. I, don't, I see what's going on, and I can right. shout it from the housetops of what's going on. And if the, the more, the more uh, publicity I gave to it, probably the more likely I'd be thrown in jail or be killed. So... You know, because the Illuminati is going to bring in the Chinese currency. They're going to bring in Bitcoin or some digital currency. That's what they're working toward. And right. they don't listen to me one bit. And if I'm a threat to them, they're going to get rid of me. That's just how it is. So since there's nothing I can do about it, even though my wealth is based in a capitalist dollar rather than a communist dollar, and I know that's going to go away, um, since I can't control it, there's no need for me to worry about it. It's just you make decisions based upon that. So like I'm not going to sell this house and just put all this money in the bank because I right. know that that money due to inflation and bankruptcy of the currency, it's all going to be gone. So I say, okay, knowing what's going to happen and that I don't have any control over it, I'm not going to worry about it, but I'm still going to make wise decisions based on it. So... I want to make sure that if I do have any assets that I can safeguard, because again, 1 Timothy 5.8, if I don't take care of my household, I'm worse than an infidel, and I've denied the faith. So what I need to do is do the best I can. So it's trying to get everything into hard assets. It's making sure 
I've got a house, and I've got yeah, until, clothing, until and I've raise, got food. Until, until they raise the taxes so high that you can't hold your house. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, see, if I it's... Can see, if you can control food and housing, you've got a, you've got a made as a world leader. You know? <laughs> yeah, they're trying to keep people from owning houses through taxes. They encourage yeah. people to rent, not own a house. And if you do own yeah. a house, they have these these financial cycles that go up and down, booms and busts, so that you will your house will be foreclosed yeah. on, you'll go bankrupt. Um, yeah, and then if that doesn't work, they'll just finally tax you to death, or they'll just take it away. Somehow they'll take away all your possessions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and like up here, uh, they put. Uh, like the 566 percent increase in energy tax uh our prime minister is working towards so our gasoline was 90 something cents a liter uh you know two months ago it's now a dollar 25 a liter wow and in our home heating natural gas they're taxing that and so it's just, it's just during COVID, you know. So anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so these are the kind of things that, you know, my wife says, don't talk about it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much you know? recognizing what you can't control. So yeah. try your best. Again, you're not going to succeed 100%. Well, at least try your best not to worry yeah. about things that you can't control. Exactly. But knowing what's going on, make your decisions and say, well, what's the best decision for me? I'm definitely not going to sell my house and put it in a savings account because then they'll just take all my money. Yeah. So I'll exactly. keep the house and it's going to be, yeah, they're going to take the house eventually if the world goes on long enough, but right. at least yeah. I'll keep it a little longer. I'll keep myself right. financially yeah. solvent where I am taking care of my house to the best that I can. You look at like the, the Israelites in Egypt. You know, they are persecuted. They're slaves. I mean, they can't, they don't own a house or anything. They're slaves. Then God starts to deliver them. And now the Pharaoh takes away their straw to make the bricks. So now they got to go hunt down brick, you know, straw to make right. the brick. Um, right. Yeah, they didn't have any control over the economy. They're just dirt poor and getting worse. Um, yeah. You know, what are you going to do? Well, I could worry about it and get all in a tizzy, but I still can't control it because the Pharaoh owns everything. He controls everything. So all I do is I just make the best of the situation that I have. So, uh, you know, my heart goes out to like Danny and Shelly who have young children, you know, like, wow. You know, I mean, I'm past that point. My daughter's married and, you know, but, uh, yeah, you know, just get the word into them and, you know, just, you know, pray that they're saved. And, um, but anyways, yeah, it's, it's kind of those of us who are older and come near the end, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's not as bad. But for younger guys like uh, uh, Danny, you know. Well, I take comfort in the fact that the rapture must take place before all these other events of the Antichrist are fulfilled. So, yeah. Yeah. you can see things getting worse, and you can see they'll eventually take everything you have, but um, I may be raptured up before that even happens. Because these, right. these prophecies aren't going to be fulfilled until after, none of them are going to be fulfilled until after the rapture of the church. That's true. And That's if you true. see this, like we talked about with Danny, if it's getting closer and closer, then I know the rapture is getting closer. So um, I'd be I'd be absolutely shocked if 2031 rolls around and I'm still on this earth. I think by 2030, the great reset that they're calling, and that fits along with yeah. Scripture. We talked about that before. Uh, right. I think the rapture uh, occurs by 2030. I'd be absolutely shocked if 10 years from now I'm sitting in front of a camera doing a Bible study or just studying, just alive on the earth, I'd be absolutely right. shocked. So I think uh, we're, we're less than 10 years away from the rapture. Um, and so... Danny, I think Danny, I'm not that young. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But uh, like, he's, like, like Eric said, with the children, uh, that's my main focus, is to keep them on the rapture, uh, knowing that the law is going to come back before it all gets to yeah. the point where they want to give it to. And then try to just let them have a normal life uh, and... Uh, they know that I'm quite an, a, a guy that's, that's kind of anti-establishment. I'm, I'm, I'm just the way I am. When I see the things that go on, I just can't go along with them. Like I'm sort of like the last resistant. I, I, I try my best not to wear a face mask uh, in the supermarkets and stuff like that because, uh, how can I put it, I just, that's just the way my mind thinks. I, 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 you know, if I'm forced to wear one, I'll wear one. If I, when I go to work, I'm, I may have to wear one. But if I can not wear one, I won't wear one. So I kind of take them on that adventure as well. But then just keep them as normal children. Keep them yeah. positive. Let them continue on with their education. Uh, like you said, I see it all going around. And uh, uh, I don't watch the TV. That's what I said to my wife right from the, from the get-go. Turn, them, turn the TV off. Turn the radio off. If you're going to turn it on, just watch your DVDs, listen to some nice music or whatsoever is comforting to you. But don't get involved with the media. Don't get involved with the narrative because it is, it, you know, it's too frightening for some people. That's why they, most people are where they're, they're at now. Uh, and they believe in that the government are going to bring this great salvation through vaccinations and, and, right. and lifting... Uh, the lockdowns and they'll be free again but uh, that's what happens when you don't put your head in the Bible yeah uh, yeah okay yeah Philippians oh, thanks, 4 thanks. you know thanks, Philipp ben. Philippians 4 says to be careful for nothing so don't worry about yeah. it but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your request be named, known unto God and then it says, Peace of God which passes all understanding and guard your hearts and minds. But then verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And it's hard for me to think on these things if I'm listening to the news. Because the news is not telling me things that are true, honest, just, etc. I'm finding those things only in God's Word and the preaching of God's Word rightly divided. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So I stop watching the news, and I listen to Les Feldick, and then I listen to the King James Bible. And so now I'm thinking on things that are true, honest, just, etc., instead of thinking on Satan's lie program propagated by the media. And, and to wrap it all up and listen to your wife. Yes. <laughs> to tie it yeah. all together. <laughs> Yeah, because she's got the she's got the female have, mind in Christ that I don't have. Yeah. I've come to this conclusion, and I've said this to Elizabeth now since I've been sick now uh, for the last six years. Listen to your wife, and yeah, that's my motto now. No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, yeah, women.